unstructured AI, state machines, behavior trees, or go goal-oriented action planning. Which of these is the right AI behavior framework for you to use in your game? Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy. Here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become reality by helping you choose the right AI behavior framework for your game. We'll start off with unstructured AI programming. This is most likely the way that you first started writing AI whenever you implemented AI for the very first time. We just start writing logic. Maybe we say, oh, here's how we attack. Here's how we follow the player. And then you just kind of link them all together roughly. And this is actually a really good approach when you have very little AI behavior. If they're incredibly simple with one or two states that they need to worry about, this actually works really well and you can get up and running and there's no extra bloat with complexity that you're not concerned with. You just start writing code, make the things do whatever they need to do, and your AI starts working. But this has a really low upper bound of how maintainable it is. If you have more than one or two different things that you need your AI to do, this quickly becomes a tangled web of nightmarish cross dependencies. You may be surprised to learn that Llama Survival Zombies are using this approach. All these zombies do is spawn into the game, chase the player, attack whenever they're in range, and die. So there's not really a lot of complexity there, right? There's a zombie that will spawn and after X number of seconds, they will start chasing and they will always chase forever. They never leave the chasing state. Whenever they're close enough to the player because the player didn't move fast enough or they didn't die before they got to the player, a trigger in front of them will trigger to say, hey, let's start attacking. So they'll start attacking and they'll start attacking and every X number of seconds, they'll deal damage. Then whenever their health reaches zero, they'll die. So Pretty simple, not a lot going on. You don't need necessarily a bigger framework to manage this because that's all they're ever gonna do. Bosses, however, introduced some new challenges because they need to consider when should they use skills. Whenever they're doing skills, they don't wanna be doing other things. And I continued using the same approach when I first started doing bosses. And that's where we see the nightmare comes into play. Each skill had a different behavior and whenever behavior needs to say, oh, I'm going to charge at the player. Now, the charge script needs to know about the movement script and the attack script to disable those until they're done charging and then re-enable those. Something also needs to know about, oh, I'm currently charging, so I don't want to be doing those things. And I also don't want to use any other skills in the middle of doing that charge. So I think you can quickly see how this becomes everything needs to know about everything, which is dependency nightmare that we always try to avoid in software development. It's also nearly impossible to debug this because we're running in a high FPS, 30, 60, 100 FPS type of environment. And when something is not working the way you expect it to, it's really hard to find what caused the state to change when I'm trying to look at five, six, seven different scripts to see which variable got switched by what to make this happen. So in summary about the unstructured AI approach, the pros for this are you can get up and running incredibly quickly. There's no extra framework to worry about. You just put in the behaviors. That's really the only pro here. For the cons, basically everything is a con in this approach. It doesn't scale up past a couple of different things that you want to do. Really more than two things, it starts becoming a nightmare. Most of the cons stem from that because it becomes very hard to see what's going on and debug. It's very hard to scale up because just everything's connected to everything. And if you ever have to come back to modify that code, you are going to be totally lost. The rest of these structured frameworks we're gonna talk about are all designed to help remove that web of interdependent code by providing us a structured way to have actions and conditions for when we should perform those actions. By putting a framework around this, we remove the my charge script needs to know about my movement and my attack and anything else that needs to be going on and provides us a consistent way of managing. Here's when we're going to attack. Here's when we're going to charge. Here's when we're going to chase. And the first one we're going to talk about is the state machine. And I actually first heard about the state machine in college. I think getting a college education is really valuable. And that's where I'd like to talk to you about today's video sponsor. Southern New Hampshire University, or SNHU. SNHU provides low-cost, affordable game development and computer science degrees that can help you level up your game dev skills. Now, you may not know, I have a software engineering degree, and I feel like it's added a lot of value just going to college, getting that degree, helped me understand how does software work, 
how do things like state machines work, for example, and how do video games work, which is why I'm partnering with SNHU to bring you information about how you can get a college degree from an accredited university with two accredited degree programs that I want to talk to you about today. One is a computer science degree, which is very similar to the software engineering degree that I have, and a game design and game development degree if you're more interested in specializing in game design and development. In that degree program, you'll learn things like what we talked about on this channel about how to implement things with gameplay, AI, physics, all of these things that we talk about on this channel. You'll get structured lectures from university professors who have real world experience. You can get either of these degrees online through SNHU at a really affordable price. If you're interested in learning more about these degree programs, you can go to snhu.edu slash LOM Academy, fill out the form there, and a real person will contact you to help you understand how these degree programs can specifically help you. Again, that's snhu.edu slash LOM Academy. Go there, fill out the contact form, and someone will contact you with more information about the specific degree program that you're interested in. State machines, sometimes called finite state machines, are the next step up in terms of AI behavior. These have been around for a long time and they're a really powerful tool. If you've ever used the animator before, you're probably already familiar with what a state machine is. The animator is a quintessential example of a finite state machine. You add in states and define transitions from one state to another. That's adding in animations and saying, I want to transition from this animation to that animation whenever this condition or this set of conditions is true. When I first started using the animator, this was really easy to understand, I could visualize why we were in one state versus another and why we would transition from one to the next. As I started adding more animations and needing more transitions from that state to this state, I started noticing the problem that you may have also noticed with state machines. Once you have 20, 30 different animations, you end up with this huge tangled web of everything's connected to everything. And much like animations, the problem we run into with AI is we want them to be very responsive, which means most of the time we want every node or almost every node to be connected to almost every other node. That gives us n squared number of transitions or close to n squared number of transitions. So for example, if n, we have 10 states, n is 10, 10 squared is 100 transitions that we then need to worry about. And that's really unreasonable to define. And that's why you'll see people say that they don't like to use the animator in the way it was intended to be used. It's really that they don't like to use a state machine because of all of these transitions between different states. So the pros of a state machine are they're relatively easy to understand. How do they work? There's not a lot of extra framework code to put in here, so it's still pretty fast to get set up. And we can even have a visualizer like what we see in the animator to see exactly which state we're in, when we're transitioning and why we're transitioning to that state. So debugging this is way easier. The cons of state machine, much like the unstructured approach, is eventually it doesn't scale up very well anymore. There's a limited number of states and transitions that we can do before it just becomes a mess. And much like the unstructured approach, most of the cons stem from that scalability problem. Each state has to know about every next state that it can go to, and we have to define those transitions to those next states. It also has to know about the conditions in which it should go to that next state. So as we add new features into the game that maybe we need to consider for, oh, I want to go to a new state only when this thing is not happening, we have to go and update a really large number of conditions. We might miss one and then wonder why something is not happening the way we expected it to. Up next, the behavior tree. Behavior trees have just exploded in popularity in the AI space. Like their name suggests, we use a tree structure to define the behavior that we'd like the AI to perform. These are usually defined with a visual editor just because it's really easy to visualize and understand what's going on and how every one of these nodes connects to one another. We start with a single root node, we come down and then we make some decisions from there. We come to another node that maybe sequences some other nodes together, or maybe it says, let me choose one of the nodes beneath it. Every node will return either success, failure, or hey, I'm still running. Unlike the state machine, the control flow starts at the top and comes down instead of every node knowing the next state and all the transitions. And the parent node is going to define what do we do next based on the feedback of success, failure, or I'm still running from the child nodes. This behavior tree we've been looking at was designed with Opsiv's Behavior Designer. That's one of the most popular Unity assets for behavior trees. 
I purchased this some time ago when it was on sale and you can always find the latest sales in the description of my videos. And that's a great way to passively support this channel if you're getting value out of these videos. We can see clearly in this flow, we enter, we find the next gold field target, ensure nobody's using that node. And if they're all in use, we'll just sit here idle. Then we'll move the gold field once one becomes available. We'll repeat the mining a few times, consider if we can return the gold. If not, we'll go to a waiting point. Then once it's available, we'll go to loading dock, wait for it to be available, and then unload the gold. This one is pretty straightforward. And as you can see with this behavior designer, we can monitor exactly what the AI is doing, why it's doing that thing, and see as it transitions from one leaf to another. There are a lot of tools around behavior trees because they're so popular. I know about Ops's behavior designer, I know about AI tree, node canvas. These are three nice looking ones I've seen on the asset store a bunch of different times. Picking up one of these tools lets you focus on designing the AI behavior instead of creating your own behavior tree system and all the tooling that comes with it, which I think we'll start with the cons of behavior trees is you do need some tooling around it for it to really be understandable. So if you're not taking an off the shelf behavior tree system, you might be spending a lot of time frameworking instead of designing and working on your game. It's more complex to get up and running and everything has limits. Behavior trees as well can run into scalability issues and performance issues if you have a really complex tree and don't really watch yourself there as you get into complex AI behaviors. But on the pro side, behavior trees are popular for a reason. They're really easy to understand what's going on, to visualize and debug. And it is a really scalable solution. They're popular for a reason. If you have moderate to complex AI, behavior trees are a great option. Now let's talk about GOP, Goal Oriented Action Planning. This one is by far the most complex one to understand and really visualize how does it work from just words. Goal Oriented Action Planning, as the name suggests, we want to define goals and actions. So what goals do I want my AI to do? And what actions can they possibly take? Then we'll organize those goals with a list of priorities saying this is my first priority, second priority, third priority, so on. And the GOP system will come up with, if I want to achieve this first priority, what actions do I need to take? Maybe I need to do only two actions to get that first priority, but those actions have dependencies. Maybe to kill the player, I need a weapon. I don't have a weapon. Maybe I can craft a weapon. To craft a weapon, I need some resources. To get resources, I need to mine something. To mine something, I need to get a pickaxe. To get a pickaxe, I need to do something else. And so that's where this action planning comes in. Once it's said, okay, hey, I need to do all of those things to kill the player, that may be the, the thing that they need to do. But they may also say, hey, I'm actually really hungry right now because my goal also is to live. So I'm going to go over here and eat some food first, and then maybe we'll start working on the killing the player thing later. That's really the idea here. We have a list of priorities of goals. We have a set of actions we can do, and we'll try to find which goal is the easiest one to do now or the most pressing one to do now. And that's based on some variables that we have usually on a blackboard to say, here are all the data points that I have to make decisions. So I'll choose to do these particular actions to reach this particular goal right now, because that's what the world tells me is the most feasible thing for me to be working on. Much like behavior trees, building your own GOP system might be a lot of work for you to do. I found that there's this 500 starred GitHub repository that's also on the asset store that helps you get up and running quite quickly with GOP. And like I said, as over 500 stars, it's really popular. A lot of people like this framework. So that's the one that I started to use for this demo that we're going to see right now. And I'm taking what's called the complex scenario, which still is pretty simple, but it does have different types of AI that do different things and whatever they're doing kind of plays off each other. This particular system does not have a visual editor. I'm not 100% sure how we would have a visual editor for this, but you can set it up using primarily the inspector and some editor tooling. Once we're at runtime though, we can visualize here are my goals, here are the actions that support those goals, and here are the prerequisites for those actions. So the actions I need to take before I can take that other action. For this particular AI, there's only four goals, wandering, fixing hunger or eating, picking up an item and gathering items. In the visualization, we can see the paths to achieve each of these goals and the different options available to get there. 
For example, we can gather iron in two different locations, but it requires first picking up a pickaxe. So if we don't have one, we'll do that one first. In large scale games, you may have dozens of goals per AI and maybe even hundreds of actions. For some simplistic games, you may only have three or five goals and a handful of actions. The pros of this are it really is the most flexible and scalable solution for planning actions or for behavior AI. The cons of this are it's really a paradigm shift for how do you think about writing your AI and you may get unexpected results. It may come up with ways that you didn't initially think that it could do something and you can get weird results. That was something I think in the stalker games was the AI designers were very surprised by some solutions the AI, AI came up with. Performance can be an issue here. You really need to monitor the depth of these gope trees that get built because they can take some time to evaluate. And if you're going to hit this constantly or every few frames or something like that, it can really bog down the performance. So it's something to keep in mind. You want shorter trees and the fewer variables you can have, the better as well in terms of performance. I guess the last con is some tools like what we talked about today that doesn't have like a visual editor drag and drop like what we saw with behavior trees, which can make it more complex to understand and to set up. In summary, the cons are it's complex and the pros are it's complex and scalable. Before I really got into behavior frameworks, I couldn't really visualize Gope and I was struggling to understand why a behavior tree was significantly better than a state machine. I hope this video helped to demystify that for you as well. If you got value out of this video and you want to support this channel passively, you can just click on one of those affiliate links to Humble Bundle or the Asset Store in the description. And that really helps me out a lot. And you don't have to do anything extra. You just shop as you were shopping on those stores before. Or if you've been getting so much value and you want to directly support the channel, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy or click super thanks or join right here on YouTube. You'll get your name up here on the screen and get a shout out at the awesome tier and higher. At the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen, at the Tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. At the Awesome tier, there's Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan Rulin, Ify Obelis, Solar Int, and Dwarf. And of course, there's all of these supporters as well. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.